This is Sign Language with Bruce Williams and Doc Goldstein. Hi, and welcome to episode 163 of Sign Language. This is Bruce Williams from SignLanguagePodcast.com. Joining me once again via Skype, eventually, Doc Goldstein. How are you, mate? (laughs) I'm good now. Oh, oh, man. We've just had the worst half hour of our lives, I swear. Well, we had no client looking over our shoulders, so that's okay. Yeah, exactly. So here's an interesting thing. For the last umpteen million years i have had my microphone plugged into channel one of the two channel mic pre that came with this microphone which is an aea trp the ribbon pre right well let me just say let me just interrupt to say that that is a really high quality preamp oh it is it's lovely it is absolutely lovely i I love this mic and the preamp and you know i've never had issues with either of them you know they're, they're a great combination And about, oh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, I decided that I should really use the other channel just so the other channel gets used. (laughs) That maybe sounds crazy. But I unplugged the microphone from the channel one input of the TRP and I plugged it into channel two. And I did all of the things that are necessary in the user interface of the sound card in windows to say you know instead of using channel one i'm now using channel two but is there a, is there by any chance a not even pan pot on that preamp yes there is and i have addressed that and so i did everything to set channel two up exactly the way channel one has been set up for the last you know 10 years and i've recorded other podcasts in the last couple of weeks without any issue whatsoever and yet this morning doc and i go to record and suddenly Skype is not hearing my microphone. And it took us half an hour of trying everything and getting nowhere. And I eventually thought, you know what, I'm just going to go and unplug the microphone and plug it back into the channel one of the preamp and see if that makes a difference. And so I went around the back of the rack and I unplugged the mic from the mic pre and immediately got my ears blasted with hiss because suddenly there's no load on the, on the, on the channel. And I plugged it into channel one and I came back around to the computer and I've opened up channel one on the sound card uh, interface and immediately heard myself. And I heard you at that point. I went, hey! You heard me hey, briefly, th- yeah. And so... Um, And so then I've gone in and double-checked the settings in Skype, and suddenly it's all working. And the thing I don't understand is why would Channel 2 not work, but Channel 1 does work? And the only thing that I can think of is that Skype views a two-channel input from a sound card as, you know, mono must be the odd number of the pair. That is the only thing I can think of. That's why I asked if you had a pan pot on your preamp, because maybe you had it panned odd, but you were using the even input. Sorry, not on the preamp, no. On the sound card interface, there is a pan pot, but not on the preamp Uh. itself, no. Okay. So, yeah, that that is just weird. So, tip for young players, if you uh, are having issues with getting your microphone into Skype... Uh, make sure you're using the odd number of of the pair. So that's generally the left channel, not the right channel. But I just, I cannot believe that that would be an issue. This sounds like remedial audio (laughs) class 101. (laughs) Uh, We started looking for alternate uh, applications, you know. We started, well, let's try this software. No, 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 let's try this one. Well, this software isn't isn't any easier, you know. Uh, Crazy. So how you been? I've been I've been really good. So just so we can set the clocks right, let me just say that here in Southern California, as we record this, it's five fifty seven PM on Friday. Yes. And here it's three minutes to midday on Saturday. <laughs> wow. So you're still ahead of me. I can't catch up. <laughs> Sadly, no, mate. I don't think you're ever going to catch up. <laughs> so I've been fine, but you were under the weather a week ago I or two, was, right? I was. Yeah, last week I was not. I was just battling a cold, and uh, I, I had a, a really horrible, phlegmy cough a week ago. T- today it's 
it's settled down. It's still a bit scratchy, and occasionally I'll have a dry cough, but it's okay. You know, I, I can. Live you with sound it. fine. Yeah. Now I might sound different to some people out there with discerning ears, because you know, I've been using a fifty-seven, you know, an SM fifty-seven, yep. but just for the hell of it. Today, I dragged out my U87 from Mothballs. Oh, sweet. And this is like an old 30-year-old 87. It, you know, it's it's all dented from being too close to Tom Toms. Yep. You know, nice. and it, you know, nice. but, it, and it's got a battery compartment in it, which kind of gives you an idea yeah. of the age of the mic, wow. you know? So I'm using that today, but I'm, I have it rolled off. I have a, a filter engaged at a hundred Hertz cause there's nothing below there, but trouble. Yep. Well, I'll, I'll be keen to hear the, the recorded voice track from your end. Uh, for those who haven't worked it out, doc records his voice track to his pro tools rig and then sends me that WAV file. Uh, and I then yep. marry them both up because I'm recording the Skype call to split channels. So I've got me on the left channel and Doc on the right channel. So when I receive Doc's WAV, I can then drop that into Reaper and line it up alongside the the Skype call, uh, simply using the waveform as a visual guide. And then I mute his side of the Skype call and so I've got me in studio quality and I've got him in studio quality but of course as we're recording this I'm only hearing the Skype call which is you know like listening to a phone call so I I look forward to hearing your U87 in all of its studio quality glory doc. Well the way you put that in sync is not unlike the way you would sync dailies to the one-to-one track on a TV show or a feature film if you're not using uh, time code to do an auto assemble pass. Right You you just visually line it up. Yeah yeah, and when it flanges, you're good. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah and, and when I, it sounds like Ichiku Park. Do you know what? I do that a lot with my home movies. Uh, when when Kath and I travel, uh, I take a little handheld video recorder, but I also take my little Tascam uh, audio recorder. And if I want to do some stuff to camera, I'll generally take the handheld recorder and I'll record into that. Uh, and, you know, Kath might be videoing me from, say, 10 or 15 feet away. And so I'll hear, you know, the, the, the camera microphone will hear me, but from a distance. But I've always got that close mic sound from the handheld recorder. And so when I come to editing that video, I'll drop the WAV file from the Tascam in alongside the, the video footage and just visually line it up and then mute. Wow, them. man. You mean you're not using, uh, you know, a time code clapper <laughs> and house sync and all that? No, mate. I'm oh, not. man, I'm just, I am sorely disappointed now, <laughs> i got to tell you. <laughs> hey, it does the job. It does the job. Absolutely. There Absolutely. Was, there was a time uh, about three, oh, God, no. My goodness, it was four years ago now. Uh, we went on this road trip and uh, we drove to Western Australia and back, which was, you know, that's three and a half thousand kilometres in each direction. So, you know, we did 10,000 kilometres in 21 days. Um, so it was a big, wow. big road trip. And uh, there was one place we stopped at, uh, a place in South Australia called Pildapa Rock. Uh, and this is a massive granite monolith not quite as big as Ayers Rock but it is actually Australia's second largest monolith after Ayers Rock and Max and I we climbed up to the top and I took the audio recorder with me and Kath stayed down in the car park and she videoed the pair of us up on the top of this rock so we were like 150 meters away and so I just I yelled out to her are you recording and she you know she gave me the wave and so I've then started recording on the Tascam and I've said to Max put your hands out wide and then clap them together you know wide enough so that the video camera can see it from that far away uh, and, Absolutely. I got, and I got his clap and of course you know my little Tascam recorder picked up the sound and I used that visual reference and the audio reference to line them up <laughs> and did my little commentary. No, that, re- that reminds me of a really f- interesting thing when I was like 15 years old I went to Dodger Stadium to see the Beatles play on their last tour. Wow. You know I'm, o- I'm old enough to have done that right <laughs> and what i'll always remember i, I always remember a few things mm. uh, one of the things i remember is that they did they did yesterday with drums and electric guitars and all that okay which was released later on a, on uh, on a record but that that version but what i really remember is that i was so far away that when ringo's hand came down to hit the snare drum i heard it like 
you know, a half a second later, yeah, there was right. this big delay. Yeah. Because back then they didn't have, you know, PA systems with the right amount of delay and all that happy stuff that I have today. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, no Blue Net or no Dante, you know, no, no uh, audio over Ethernet or anything like that. So it was pretty ragged. But that kind of reminded me of what you were saying because when he clapped his hands, you were able to use that to sync the delay up. Yeah. All right. So um, I thought before we get started, uh, I wanted to throw back to Dave King's email from uh, episode 161. Dave, we answered some of your questions, but it occurred to me afterwards that we didn't get around to your question about where is the PC or the Mac, as as the case may be, located within a professional studio. For my studio at home, as I said, you know, it, it, it's sitting underneath the desk at which I'm sitting now. And, you know, the microphone does a pretty good job of rejecting that noise because I've sort of got the microphone pointed. So where I hear the majority of the PC noise coming from, I've got the side of my figure eight pointed in that direction. So it nulls out. As for my work studio at the radio station we again have this big curved custom built furniture but the pc just sits underneath along with two others i have three pcs in my control room one is the machine that the digital audio workstation software which in our case is steinberg nuendo is running on there's another pc which runs the what's called next gen which is the software that the radio station uses for the digital play out to air Uh, and i i need that software in my studio so that when i finish mixing commercials i can dump them into the on-air system ready to get play to air so that machine's always running and then there's an internet pc which has you know microsoft office and all of the general software that we use you know, in a radio station, you know, so there's Word, there's Excel, there's Outlook, you know, internet browser, all that sort of stuff. So both of those two first PCs, you know, the the digital audio workstation and the next gen machine, they are not visible to the internet. They're connected to the WAN within our organization, uh, but they are firmly ensconced behind a firewall of epic proportions. But the actual PC boxes, they just live underneath the desk at which I'm working. But the thing is, I don't record voiceovers in that control room. I have a dedicated voice booth. So when I'm recording voice tracks you know, for commercials or whatever, the voice talent is actually in an isolation booth uh, and I'm listening to them through my monitoring in the, the studio. And the PC noise is generally not an issue for me. Doc, your system at home? Well, at home, as I said in a prior podcast, you know, I'm kind of cheating. I have the computer kind of close and I'm using a cardioid pattern, so I'm lulling it out like you. But in professional studios, there's usually been a machine room. Right. Well, let's go back in time. So back when there was this thing called tape, you know, (laughs) we'd have the tape machines in the control room against the back wall, but we'd have them under a soffit and that would help kind of kill the noise from the machines. But you still had to get to the machines to edit or thread up or whatever. But once things went digital and computers were involved, then we started putting all the computers and anything else that made noise and that had fans on it, like you know, near-line storage, for example, uh, RAID arrays and whatever else, we'd start putting that stuff in machine rooms and KVM our way out to where the console was. So, and we talked about KVMs before. So, yes, in the professional studios that I've built or that I've been in since the digital age, there's been even the smaller less expensive facilities, they do have a, a separate machine room to, with a rack or two or 30 racks if it's a big facility, <laughs> yeah. you know, so so you don't hear all that noise because, you know, clients, they get real persnickety about that sort of thing. Plus, you've got so much going on besides just the computer. We, we, we've got, you know, switches and storage and every other kind of thing in there. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. KVM is your friend. And. In your experience, what's the maximum distance that KVM will work over and and still be reliable? Well, the ones um, I've used recently were digital and they didn't really have, we didn't have to care about how far away things were. Uh, We didn't have to care at all. It didn't make any difference. Uh, Back in the analog days, 
when we started using KVMs and we had this analog one, uh, we still didn't have to worry. The machine room was probably 300 feet away from one of the mix rooms and it was fine. Wow. So that was fine. And then this last studio that I helped build, it was a newer digital system and it just didn't matter. It was all Ethernet, you know. Yeah, right. It was fine. So the video signal for the monitor, the keyboard, the mouse, was there anything beyond that? No, but what the, ni- the nice thing about it is you can sit at the computer and hit enter a couple times if it's that kind of system or another couple of keys, depending on what brand it is, and pick up any of the computers that are on that network. So if you have like oh, wow. 15 computers in a room because you've got dialogue, music, two sound effects, you got a Foley computer, you got the music editor, and then when the client shows up and they bring all their own workstations and all the stuff gets plugged in, and console automation and the sound master, which is the, the motion control, all these things you know, have a video output, and you can just sit there at the KVM and dial up which any, any one of those that you want. So it's, it's really handy in a larger environment to have that. Yeah, yeah, nice. So it means you don't have to have you know, a ridiculous Starship Enterprise fleet of monitors and keyboards and mice in front of you. You can just have one. Oh, no, we have that. No, we have that because everybody, because everybody, you know, if you have a bunch of editors in there and mixers and and you've got the producer and then the executive producer and the future ex-wife of the executive producer, you know, and 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 everybody has to have their own flat screen and mouse because they want to play video games while you're mixing or they just need to be able to see what, if all the editors need to see their own stuff, but they also need to be able to switch to somebody else's and not get up in their chair and run around to another monitor. So, yeah, right. no, there, it wouldn't be unusual to have 10 monitors in a room if you have 10 workstations plus automation and, and motion control and anything else that you might need to see. So, yeah. Yeah, but I, I just meant from a single user point of view, it, it, it certainly alleviates the need for multiple sets of monitors and keyboards and mice and all that sort of stuff. Well, for, for one person, it's great because yeah. you can just switch what you want to see. Like the really good thing is to have two monitors and use one of them for if you're mixing the picture to have picture there or if you're not, maybe have your motion control or your automation on one window and then your workstation on the other. That's kind of handy. Yeah. It just depends on what your needs are. Yeah, well, that's sort of how my setup is at work. I have a pair of 24-inch 1920 by 1080 screens side by side yeah and one side has the the track layout of nuendo and the other side has the mixer layout uh so that way i'm seeing the best of both worlds nuendo is good software it is a good great software and guess what within the next eight weeks we're being told we're going to be forced to switch to pro tools (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> I'm uh, mildly apprehensive about how that's going to fly because uh, th- thankfully they have said we're going to Mac-based Pro Tools. We're not going to Windows-based Pro Tools. So I am thankful for that. I think that's good. I'm not against PCs, but I th- I just think that Macs are good with Pro Tools. And I think you'll if you go to the right version of Pro Tools, you shouldn't have any stability problems really no, i mean you're going to go to a, you're going to go to an hd system i assume i don't know that we'll be going to an hd system because we're only doing radio we're only doing 44 one we really don't need the massive track count so i would i would expect it'll just be basic pro tools but it will be version is 12 current or is it 13 that's current no, 12 is 12, 12, 12 point is whatever going, yeah right so i i assume we'll be going to version 12 And I'm glad that it's the Mac version because every audio engineer that I've ever spoken to who has used Pro Tools on both Mac and PC, every one of them to the end of the queue has said it is so much easier and more reliable and stable on a Mac than on a PC. Including me. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, but let me just say, I know you say it's only a radio station, but for those of you who are persnickety out there, I would just say that one advantage of going to HD is that you can you plug in the PCIe card, which has the chip in it that does the mixing, and you can talk to more expensive uh, converters than you can without being HD. Oh. And I think that's a quality improvement. So I would think twice... And I don't mean to say that you can't get good converters on a non-HD system. I'm not saying that, but you do have more choices when you are HD. And it's nice having the double EEPROM or whatever you call it, FRPG chip inside the PCIe card. 
so you know, takes a little bit of the load off. The non HD version of Pro Tools, which I think they just refer to as Pro Tools, don't they? I think so. Yeah. yeah. So does it come with Avid converters, or can you buy whatever you want? You can buy whatever you want. Right. You know, and there are there are good other companies out there, third party companies that that make good converters, and there's no question about it. Yeah. But I just tell you, when I was helping to build big facilities, the one thing I always thought about was I always kept with Avid hardware and software together because I, if I had a technical problem or some kind of weird glitch or we had to chase something, I didn't want finger pointing between yeah. two different companies. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I remember years ago we had an issue when, when 7 4 first came out, which is a long time ago, and we had an issue and they flew somebody down from Avid to help us figure it out, and they did, and it was all great. But if we had been using some third party converter, it would have been very easy for, for any company to say, oh, well, it must be this other thing that you're using. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. not, it's not, we don't test it with that. Yeah. Right. So I would just think about it. Yeah, well, look, it's not my uh, decision, unfortunately. I don't get to sign the checks, so uh, I'll, sure. I'll get whatever they deem you know to give us. So I've uh, because I'm a, a former author with Lynda.com, I have a, a lifetime access to Lynda.com. So I've started watching the essential training for uh, Pro Tools. I actually think it's Pro Tools 11 that the training is being... Uh, actually, it might be... Or is it 12? Anyway, whatever. Well, the 12, 12 books are out. So there's Pro Tools 101. The first book is Pro Tools 101, and the second one is Pro Tools 110. Right. And those those are really good training books. Yep. And I, I've trained people using those books, and they're very good. Yeah, right. Plus, there's a few shortcuts I can show you. Cool. <laughs> I think that's going to be... I think that's going to be the big biggest thing is just you know remapping all the neural pathways for for shortcuts to do things you know because uh, i live and die by keyboard shortcuts so well there's plenty of keyboard shortcuts in pro tools especially if you use this thing that call keyboard focus where you can turn that on and there's a whole bunch of already preset keyboard commands yeah and there's even a few without that turned on as well so that's pretty good and you can always use quick keys if you had to and I'm assuming all of the keyboard shortcuts are customizable. Well, it's a Mac. You can customize any key to do anything if you want to in the OS. Right. You know, but I think you'll be happy with what's there, especially if you get a Pro Tools keyboard so that you you know, you know can see what all the shortcuts are right there on the keyboard. Yeah, because the I keys think, are colored and they, they have the graphics on there. Yeah, they're ordering those, I believe. So Yeah. It'll be and interesting. And you can buy a KB cover for your home. You know, a, you know KB makes these like $15, very inexpensive, rubberish covers that go over a regular Mac keyboard and add all that. Right. And you just literally, it just sits right on your keyboard. And they make those for, you know, picture workstations and Pro Tools and various other workstations. And so you can get what you need there. Yeah, cool. And that's handy too. Yeah, so fun times ahead. We've got a uh, one of our audio engineers who is currently running a Pro Tools system. She's going on maternity leave in eight weeks' time. And so... They're looking to find a freelancer who will come in and replace her for the time that she's off. And they want they want to get myself and Greg, the other commercial producer, onto Pro Tools so that we're learning Pro Tools so that if any of the stuff that Leah has worked on before she goes on maternity leave, we can at least access it and understand it. Because if at the moment, we're just in the dark. You know, if we have to access some of her work, we've got no idea because we don't use Pro Tools. So... Sure. Well, congratulations to her. I don't know her, but hey, that's great news for her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's pretty excited. So, yeah, absolutely. All right. So, in our last episode, we talked about microphones. And one area that we didn't get around to discussing a whole lot, and I thought we probably should talk about, is proximity effect. Oh, yeah. You know, for those who've heard the term and are maybe not quite familiar with what it is, it's the propensity, is that the word I was looking for, of, of a microphone to increase the bass response based on the distance between the sound source and the diaphragm of the microphone. Yeah. Uh, so as, as, as I get closer to a microphone, this microphone doesn't really exhibit proximity effect the way some microphones do. Because it's not cardioid, that's why. That's it's not exactly cardioid. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the research I did, Doc, suggested that proximity effect was common to most microphones except for omnidirectional. You're, you're leaning more towards it being a, related to the cardioid pattern? 
I seem to notice it more on cardioid than I do on figure eight. Uh, I certainly don't hear it in omnidirectional. No. But to be fair, I don't use figure of eight near as often as you do since you own a mic that'll only, at home that'll only do figure of eight, yeah. really. But although figure of eight, a couple of figure of eight mics is great if you have an acoustic guitar player and a singer. Oh. And they're singing and playing at the same time, and you can cancel out the guitar with one mic and cancel out the voice with the other, and that's kind of handy. But Definitely. normally, I'm just using either cardioid or omnidirectional, you know, and I don't really hear proximity effect in omnidirectional. It's not happening. Yeah, the notes that I made were that it, it, it doesn't affect a true omnidirectional mic, but if you have a microphone that has switchable polar patterns. It will affect the omnidirectional setting because that microphone is not a true omnidirectional. It's doing it through the the way the power supply is affecting the way the microphone works. And I, I will confess to not knowing enough about how that side of things works. And that proximity effect is a combination of phase difference as well as amplitude difference. So... What that means is that with an open-backed microphone, sound is approaching not only from the side of the microphone that you know, you're sitting, if we're talking about voice to microphone, but it also leaks around and into the back side of the microphone as well. And so you get a phase relationship between the sound arriving at one side of the diaphragm and that same sound traveling around bouncing off other things in the room whether it be walls or you know things on the desk and coming back into the back of the microphone so so there are phase relationships there and there are also amplitude relationships in that you know sound drops off the further it travels so you know for i think it's for every doubling of distance it drops 6 db is that right yeah. Yeah. You know, so sound degrades by 6 dB for every doubling of distance that it travels. And so naturally, the closer you get to the diaphragm of a microphone, the more you increase the distance relationship that that sound travels. You know, if you're a meter away from the microphone, the distance difference, you know, between your voice in the near side of the diaphragm and your voice in the far side of the diaphragm is actually quite negligible. But as you get closer to the diaphragm, then the the difference in distance gets exaggerated. So that's what causes an amplitude difference as, as you get closer. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, but I have to confess that, yeah, you know, I use a lot of mics with switchable polar patterns. Right. And, and I'm not really hearing a lot of proximity effect when they're set for Omni, even if there theoretically might be some. Right. Okay. I definitely, just as a, you know, real world kind of deal as opposed to the theory of it, you know, like one of the mics we use is an AR-51, which is a Telefunken mic, which okay. I love. I love this mic, by the way. Let me just say it's a fantastic microphone. It's got a... It's even got a vacuum tube and a power supply with switchable polar patterns on it. And But anyway, I'm not doing a commercial, but anyway. <laughs> so is this a large diaphragm condenser mic? It is, yeah. it is, yeah. yeah. It's great for drum overheads and vocals. Right. I'm just saying. But anyway, when I use that mic in omnidirectional, I'm not really hearing uh, a lot of proximity effect. But to be fair, that might be because when I use it in omni, it's usually because I have a bunch of singers clustered around it, and, and they're not within a few inches. Right, yeah. Uh, and right now, you know, I'm speaking into this 87, you know, the one that's got drumstick marks all over it. <laughs> and uh, I'm a foot away. Yeah. So I'm not adding any bottom because if I got closer, then you'd start telling me that my level was too hot. Right. And the other thing that I had in my notes was that the phase differential becomes greater at higher frequencies. And again, I think that's as frequency gets higher, wavelength gets shorter, and therefore you get more of a phase relationship because... Well, I, I agree. I agree with what you're saying because, yep. for example, if you look at the polar patterns of a microphone, you know, the spec sheet, yep. and they give it versus frequency, you can see that when you get up to about 16K that the polar pattern really degrades a lot yeah. and it's a little less degraded at 8 and it looks okay at 4K. This makes a difference in how you use the microphone. You know, you might not want to aim it away from something if you want a lot of high frequencies. Like, for, here's yeah. an example. 
Suppose you're using an, a Cam 184, which is a small diaphragm condenser mic in Neumann, okay. really good mic. Suppose you're using that on a hi-hat and you want to kind of aim it away from the snare drum because you want to minimize leakage. Well, that actually might not be a good idea because at, at higher frequencies, the polar pattern degrades. So you might be better off aiming it straight at the cymbals. And if you have an extra half dB of leakage, get over it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I'm just saying. But I think that, yeah, that phase differential at high frequencies probably accounts for quite a lot of that proximity effect that you know mm. as the, as as you get a phase differential at higher frequencies that that high frequency tends to drop off and that's what causes some of that proximity effect it 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 sounds like more bottom end but maybe it's the fact that your your top end is is changing is that viable doc that it, that it's a, a decrease of top end as much as it might be a build up of bottom end well, it sounds logical, but I've never noticed it that way. I just think of it as a bass boost. But sure, you know, because mm. when I'm EQing stuff, sometimes I can make something sound like it's got a lot more high end just by putting a cut around two or 300 hertz, you know, so same idea. Yeah, right. Well, I think we've covered proximity effect. Anything else you wanted to add? Covered it to death. No, <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, something, something I saw through the week, and, and this this will just be quick, that I thought was really interesting, and, and, I, and I, I said to Doc in an email, if I ever find myself bedridden for two or three weeks you know, due to illness or something, I think I'll send Kath out to buy one of these because it looks like a whole lot of fun to tinker with. I think everyone's heard about Raspberry Pi by now, uh, which is a, these little printed circuit board electronic kits you can pick them up at your your nearest electronic store and they basically run a version of either linux or android which is you know much the same thing uh, and you can create all kinds of things with raspberry pi right and it requires a little bit of software coding uh, and you can find all these fantastic projects online that you can you know use raspberry pi to create and and you can build like whole computers in a box you know not much bigger than a cigarette packet like these are phenomenally powerful devices and what i saw through the week is an indiegogo campaign for a add-on board called pi sound and this thing looks like a whole lot of fun essentially you can uh get one audio channel in and one audio channel out a midi channel in and a midi channel out and i think there was something else as well and this thing will do 192k sample rate at 24 bit wow this is a little you know printed circuit board that you can buy for about 20 bucks uh and then you know you can grab well Sorry, this this is not available on the market yet. It's an, like I said, it's an Indiegogo campaign at this point in time. They're looking to get backers uh, so that they can mass produce this as an add-on for Raspberry Pi. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And yeah, using Burr Brown chips, uh, DIN five MIDI input and output ports, user customizable button and bundled software tools. Uh, and there's, I'll put the link in the show notes for anyone that wants to check it out. It looks like it would be a whole lot of fun in your garage. <laughs> it, it does sound like a lot of fun. I could, I could just see myself bringing out my inner nerd, you know. Oh, I'd totally. Just, oh, yeah, I'd turn into a propeller head really quick, you know. <laughs> yeah. Unapologetically. And not, not to be confused, yeah, not to be confused with reason, but yeah. just, you know, a propeller yeah, head. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, that link will be in the show notes for anyone that wants to check it out. Go and have a look at the video because that that just looks like a whole lot of fun waiting to be had. Um, oh yeah. So Doc, we we spoke last episode about microphones, and you suggested that the next logical topic of discussion should be mic preamps. Well, yeah, they're a big thing these days. Take it away. What do you want to say? Well, I've just got a lot of opinions, you know. Uh, hopefully, some of them are backed up by experience, but that's never stopped me. So, um, so I remember uh, when I started recording, you know, back again, I think I've said this before, back around the time the Donner Party, you know, hit the Rockies, when my hair was brown and my teeth were white, yeah. which I have to thank Graham Edge for that joke. But uh, uh, nice. you, if you Google who Graham Edge is, if you want. Okay. But back in the day when we had, people actually had big analog mixing consoles like giant Neves or SSLs or APIs or whatever, it was rare 
for people to drag around their own mic preamps, and they didn't really make mic preamps or to go as it were. You know, there were no, no 500 series racks, and there weren't, you know, single preamps with a little chassis because we didn't really need that until workstations came into vogue. Yeah. And so workstations come into vogue, and the next thing you know, you've got people buying. Oh well, I've got to have fifty-seven thousand four hundred and sixty-eight different mic preamps because <laughs> who knows what is the best mic preamp to record a tambourine on this track, you know? <laughs> and, and and it just it just gets ridiculous where people have realistically ten or fifteen or twenty different mic preamps, and you know, I kind of have a jaundiced perspective on that, but I do think that there are differences between different mic preamps and different topographies about how they're designed. Sure. But oftentimes the best preamp to use for an overdub is the last one you use because it's already hooked up and the mic's already plugged in, so move on. (laughs) Right? Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, there's transformerless mic preamps, there's preamps that are discrete, there's preamps that are made with integrated circuits, you Mm -hmm. know, and heresy alert. Right. It is possible to have a mic preamp that is not discrete, has no transformers, and is using integrated circuits to sound good. Yes, it is possible, folks. <laughs> so when you say discrete, what do you mean by discrete? Well, it means they don't talk out of school. No, seriously. Uh, discrete. <laughs> Uh, Discrete means, for example, the input transistors would be separate from the output transistors. Like the input transistors might be a a bunch of really noise-free, match pair, current gain type of transistors, whereas the output transistors might be able to drive a lot of current down a long line, and and all the components would be discrete resistors and whatever else you have in there, diodes for biasing and whatever else would be in there. So made out of discrete electronic components so that you can... Pick the best part for the job it's going to do, whereas in an integrated circuit, you have to make some compromises. But in today's world, again, some of these compromises are made so well that I've been pleasantly surprised about some of the quality I've gotten from preamps that the internet crowd might say is not so great. But I have to tell you that there are good preamps available in all these different topographies. But having said that, I like a transformer on my mic preamps. I'm glad you went there because I I wanted to discuss what role transformers play. Well, transformers isolate because you have the magnetic lines of flux going from one coil to the other, so you don't actually have a connection. So uh, there's less chance of any kind of a ground issue, for example. So there are technical advantages, but I wasn't really thinking of that. I was thinking about the fact that I just like the sound of preamps that have transformers in them. Right. Even though I fully admit that there are some without transformers that also sound really, really good. And, you know, lately I've been using some that sound really good from a company called Audient. Okay. Yep. And I'm very happy with how their mic preamps sound and there's no transformers there. But uh, I'm kind of an old school person. Yep. But I, one example where I used a, a mic preamp that had no transformers and was very happy with the sound was that years ago, in the uh, early 80s, there was this remake of The Jazz Singer that Neil Diamond did. Yes. And yep. many of his vocals were sung through a mic preamp that I built for that purpose. And wow. I used a gain cell at that time that was popular, made by uh, Valley People. Yep. Oh, called a transamp. Right. And this was back in the era when all the console companies were advertising, oh, we're better because we have no transformers. You know, I think that was kind of a marketing thing because transformers are expensive and you can save a lot of money if you don't put them in your console. But, you know, which is why Rupert Nee still puts them in his, his yep. equipment. But in any event, for the jazz singer, he did a lot of vocals over from what was shot live. And uh, much of that was done through this preamp that I built using a transamp. So there was no transformer anywhere. And yet, turned out, I was extremely happy with how it sounded and nobody complained. So I guess it was okay. (laughs) But, (laughs) you know, the the reason why I did that was because the console that they were using to do these vocal overdubs, I wasn't real thrilled with the preamps in the console and I wanted to do something special because this movie was really a, a, had a lot of really good music in it. And I wanted to uh, have the best possible preamp for this because we came right out of the preamp into the recorder, which was analog, obviously. That's why I did it. Right, so you weren't running through a console. Only for monitoring. Yeah. 
you know, we, we only for monitoring. We weren't actually going through a console to record that stuff. Now, not all of the vocal overdubs for that movie were done using my preamp because a lot of that stuff was done at a different studio, I think Crystal Studios. Right. You know, and they had, you know, that was a great studio with great equipment. I don't know exactly what they had, but I think it was custom. Really right. high quality, though. Yeah. But in any event, the whole point of this incredibly too long of a story is that even though I, I tend to be a transformer guy with mic preamps, uh, I've had good luck without transformers. But like right now, the one I'm using to talk to you and to make this podcast is this API 500 series transformer-based preamp. And I okay. love the way it sounds. And it's not perfectly linear. You know, it's got a little mid-range forward quality to it, but I like that. Yeah. And I'd use it for anything. Now, if there are people out there listening to this podcast who want to record bebop jazz or classical music, maybe they'd want something that was more accurate. Yep. But I just don't go with a concept that you have to have a preamp for every instrument. I just think that's bogus. <laughs> I, I guess it comes down to your budget. Well, that too. And, you know, and, and, and how many bases you want to cover. And, yeah. and, the, and the range of signals that you're likely to ever have to record. Sure. I mean, a lot of people like to spend a lot of money. You know, some of my students, they, when they first come to me, they give me all this input about all the stuff they want to buy because they really need the stuff in order to get a good sound. And I spend a lot of time talking them down, yeah. you know. Yep. You know, it's really more about how you hear than what you're plugging it into. And it's and the music is more important than the engineering, by the way. Definitely. You know, so uh, you'd be amazed. Some of these people come to me and they want to buy this really expensive stuff and they want to run it at 192K and they want to do this and they want to do that. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's just the, the marketing is working really well, too yes, well. Yes, exactly. I was just about to say they've spent too much time reading the Internet. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. You know, and there are some good sites on the internet, but there are also some other sites. So yeah, you've got to be careful. That's right. I, I will say to, to Doc's students who are listening that you can go a long way to getting a great recording simply by listening to what the microphone is hearing. And a, a couple of inch movement in a microphone could save you a couple of thousand dollars in chasing your tail trying to find better preamps better microphones better this better that better something else oh i totally agree i totally agree <laughs> yeah, no. you know and latency it kind of comes into that because if if sound travels at 1130 feet per second that's roughly a millisecond per foot Mm -hmm. So students come to me and they're all worried. Oh, I've got, you know, uh, three milliseconds of latency. So what? So the microphone is two feet farther back than it was going to be in terms of what it sounds like. No, forget it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But anyway, back to microphones. So <laughs> I, I have certain, you know, preferences for microphones and preamps, but I love it when I'm shown to be wrong or there's something else that I don't expect to be good that turns out to be good uh, i'm really totally. open to that sort of thing and it's great and i've had some positive experiences with preamps lately that don't have any transformers and often are not discrete so you know I, again what i tell my students if this stuff was easy to design and it, all it meant was if it has a tube it's automatically warm and if it doesn't have a tube it's automatically cold and blah 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 if it was that simple anybody could be a designer but it's really not it's not the parts as much as it's how the parts are used in a design yeah in an integrated design that is thought through and has certain design criteria such as noise and frequency response and transit response and slew rate and all these things you know so just because something has a tube in it doesn't automatically make it better than something that doesn't have a tube in it and no. just because something has a transformer doesn't make it better but it's kind of hard to beat a jensen je16 transformer into a 990 discrete amplifier i'm just going to say that <laughs> i will take your word for it but as you say like it comes back to usage you know it all comes back to what it is you're trying to record as to whether or not you know whatever combination you're looking at is necessarily the right approach or the wrong approach oh yeah i mean it's really more about the subject matter than how you're recording it. You know, I can I, I don't want to name any names, but I can think of one record company that put out a bazillion hit records yep. that didn't exactly have the best fidelity in the world, but it didn't matter because the music was so good that no one cared. 
Sure. So I'm not doing an advertisement for doing a bad recording, but I'm just saying keep your priorities straight. Definitely. Now, I want to bring that conversation around to impedance matching. Is that something you get bent out of shape over? Does it bother you? Do you think about it? Do you not think about it? Well, I know there are preamps nowadays where you can change the impedance, you know, the input impedance of the preamp itself. And you can make it higher than the mic expects to see or lower than what the mic expects to see. And I tend to be a little old fashioned. First of all, I don't have any preamps at home that have that feature because I don't care about that feature. But if I if I did have that feature, I'd probably set it to what the mic expected to see when the designers designed it. But on the other hand, you know, if I wanted a little extra high end and I could get it by increasing the input impedance of the mic preamp, I'm not above doing that either. You know, right. but I don't have any preamps that have that feature, and I've got five or six here. Yeah, because it's a feature that I know it's a selling point, mm. uh, and there's nothing wrong with having it. But I don't care about it. Yeah, see, for me, I'm I'm in much the same boat in that I don't have that feature available to me other than the Focusrite Voice Master Pro, which is sitting in my rack and very rarely gets used, has a high impedance input for you know recording a guitar say straight in which i've never used but i have read that some engineers tend to swear by the idea that the input impedance of a device should be at least 10 times the output impedance of the previous device in that signal chain well that's bridging they call that bridging and that's fine right and well look if you've got a microphone that's putting that's got an output impedance of 200 hertz and it's plugged into a 1500 ohm mic preamp like a Neve preamp or something like that, that's bridging, but you don't need to go really high impedance. Right. And as far as having a high impedance input for a guitar, uh, I have that feature on my uh, 500 series API preamp and I use it for bass right. or guitar. I think that's great, but that's not really going through the mic preamp per se. You know, it's just an added feature that's you know not really going through all that stuff it's not seeing phantom power and blah 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 right I, i'd have to pull a schematic out to see how they achieve it though because i might be wrong but i don't think it's going through all of that all of the stuff but it's handy feature to have it's right on the front panel so yeah. i'm using a lunchbox which for yep. those who've looked into it you know this 500 series api lunchbox is a common format that you can plug a bunch of EQs or mic pre's or compressors or and, whatever and from different manufacturers. And whose lunchbox rack are you using? Is that an API rack as well? It is. Right. Yeah. Which doesn't mean that the competitors aren't good. You know, there are other brands out there. Even even Rupert Neve has one now. Yeah. You know, for those who are, are sort of sitting there scratching their head, going, "What are they talking about lunchboxes for?" Lunchbox series. What 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 is officially known as a five hundred series is a portable design of a rack which has AC power running to it and the rack has a bunch of slots and each of these slots is designed to hold a single unit and these units are 500 series units they're made by a range of different manufacturers as we've said Rupert Neve API and they're small vertical components essentially like a printed circuit board that slots into one slot on in the rack and it could be a compressor it could be an eq unit it could be a microphone preamp it could be any number of things and a lot of your big name engineers will invest in uh, you know a 500 series rack and then they'll buy a bunch of preamps or a you know, bunch of compressors or eq units and they'll fill their rack up with all of these 500 series units which then share the the power supply coming into that rack and that rack is very portable you can just pick it up and take it with you so if you're going off to track or to mix in a, a studio that you've never worked in you can take this bunch of gear with you and simply run one AC power cord from your rack into a, an AC socket on the wall and bam, you've got all of this hardware available at your disposal and then you then just use patch cords to patch in and out of all of that stuff. So for anyone who is not yeah. familiar with the, the lunchbox concept, that's it in a nutshell. Did I miss anything? Yeah, it's very cool. It's very cool. Yeah. You know, I, I like <laughs> yeah. it a lot. 
Yeah. Yeah. Just on the the subject of buying mic pre's, I found a really nice link at sweetwater.com and it's a mic pre buying guide and it's a simple one page uh, I'll put the link in the show notes for anyone that wants to have a look at that they sort of discuss stuff like tubes versus solid state the idea of hybrid preamps that have a little bit of a mixture of both or some of them even have a blend knob so you can blend between the tube circuit and a solid state circuit that would be the UA yeah that would be oh, the okay. UA Universal Audio, yep. Uh huh. Yeah, they have that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have a lot of UA equipment in my home studio. Do you? By the way, yeah. Your place sounds like a regular playground, mate. I, I have to swing by there sometime. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little bit of a swim, but sure, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're always welcome here. You'll have to go back in time one day, you know. Definitely. Definitely. Right. You know, you and Rod Taylor could change time. You know, just <laughs> get in the machine. <laughs> Right. <laughs> if anybody doesn't know what that reference is, that's relating to a 60s movie called The Time Machine. Right. Okay. That's still my favorite movie of all time. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. I saw it first time when I was a kid, you know, I still love that I'll movie. I'll have to check but, that out. But there's no preamps in it, so we'll, we'll, we'll stop talking about it. There's no preamps <laughs> in that movie. Yeah. All right. I, th- I think that pretty much does it for this episode. I, we were going to get to stereo miking techniques, but I think we'll save that for the next episode. Ooh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. That's going to be a great topic. I just recorded, uh, my class just recorded a really nice uh, stereo acoustic guitar just the other day. And we oh, had, a, yeah, it was great. We had a, a 414 on one side, which is an AKG 414. And there's yeah. like 20 different versions of it. Yes. But it was the newest, it was the newest version. The one that uses the phantom power to light the LEDs to let you see the patterns that you're in. CLB Mark II or something. I don't remember what it's which one it's called. It comes in <laughs> comes in a little ca- a little you know case, and then we used a KM one eighty four on the other side, uh, nice. and it was instead of using two mics that were the same, and it turned out really good, really good. Awesome. Well, we will we will discuss that at great length in the next episode because that sounds like a lot of fun. Indeed. Awesome, Doc. Good to talk to you again. Hey, you know, keep those cards and letters coming. Yeah, please. <laughs> we're, we're, we're very bereft of input from the listeners right now. So uh, if anyone's got anything that they want to throw in, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I'm sure they're scratching their heads after this one, right? Oh, yeah. They're scratching their heads pretty <laughs> totally, good. Totally, totally. I can be told to shut up, too. You know, it works. No, no. no. Just ask my wife up. if you don't believe it. Yeah, <laughs> just ask. All right, mate. Until we speak to you again, take care. Talk to you soon. Bye. Sign language. Another audio to you.com quality podcast. For questions, comments, and feedback, email the boys at signlanguagepodcast.com.